Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Lessons Learned. I'm Thorsten Kurt. Um, I'm ASF member and general open source guy. And sometimes I write uh, on a blog. Uh, my background usually is uh, backend architectures and stuff like that. And over the past years, I've worked quite a bit in the data area. So um, this means like from the whole pipeline, from receiving, uh, from storing and transforming and generating some numbers out of that. So my prominent uh, employees or customers were basically Juice. That's, uh, if you remember, this big startup, big high, best TV, internet, stuff like that. And that's where we used Hadoop very early on. Um, I think it was like version 014 or 15, something like that. And, um, and that's also what I'm currently helping at with SoundCloud at the moment. I guess Berlin, everyone knows SoundCloud. What do I want to talk about? So this session is about, um, yeah, well, Hadoop, is it really the right thing for you? Is it, um, how do you integrate it into your um, architecture, into your, into your company, really? And um, some tips and hints for using MapReduce, a uh, bit more low level, and um, op some operations tips and uh, community and some um, talks about the future or hopes and, and stuff like that. Um, I wasn't really sure whether I really want to give this talk because uh, for a good presentation you should be really excited and um, about everything is great. You heard all these talks about like everything is perfect, everything is great. Um, some shining through was there that like, okay, this might not be exactly um, as cool as it was in 2009 anymore. Um, but there's still a lot of buzz around Hadoop and um, for me, the buzz has faded a bit. I've been working on all these years with this software and um, I was afraid that the annoyances shine through too much. So what I'm going to do is um, I have this jar here and uh, whenever I complain too much, um, either you tell me or I realize, I'll put some money in this bitching jar. And uh, I give the jar away after um, the session. Um, and um, so the question is, how, who gets the jar? Um, if you know the movie Fight Club, where, where he cuts like little scenes into the, into the movies, uh, I'm going to do that too, not actually movie scenes and not naked. But um, um, there are a few hints and, um, from a music video and whoever tweets the uh, artist and the song first gets the jar at the end. <laughs> So, why Hadoop? Um, let's talk Hadoop. Hadoop is, is around for quite a while now, and uh, recruiters talk about big data, and I always almost throw up every time I hear this term, but anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, but it somehow means that the yellow elephant is involved. And uh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, there are many other, uh, pro uh, well, projects in this area that could also, mm, well, fit the name Big Data, but I think usually most of the time it's Hadoop. And um, Hadoop, as we heard before, consists of two different parts. Um, there's the HDFS and there's the MapReduce framework. Something I found on the net that I found quite amusing is uh, has some truth in it. So um, 
I mean, you can, in HDFS, you can store a huge amount of data. It's, um, you don't have to worry about file sizes. Um, it's fault tolerant, so if a disk dies and that happens, um, it's no big deal. You, uh, um, on top of that, you have local locality information. So um, as we heard, map reviews can work with that, but that's aside. It works great for large scans, batch processing, and durability. On the other hand, um, just like the old tapes, it's not really great for real-time queries unless you put stuff on top. So updates, deletes, and stuff like that, um, not so great. Um, and, and that's a shortcoming, you do have to worry about the number of files in the file system because that's um, handled by the name nodes and it's if you have too many files, it's, it can become a problem. Now, suddenly, um, when we're talking about tapes, buying a tape has suddenly become buying a new computer, and um, you have to factor that in. It's not like in every company you can just get a new machine and it's there, so getting tapes is, was probably much easier. Um, and the whole Hadoop is, is one of the, well, is a bit alien to developers and operations. Um, this probably comes from the fact that it's Java, but also um, the, the whole interaction and stuff like that. I'll get into that a bit later on. So you can run MapReduce map jobs across all your data, and um, um, the question is whether you really want to do it um, like that. What I did here is a very simplistic and absolutely unfair benchmark. Benchmarks suck uh, mostly by definition anyway, so it's everyone uh, no set? Huh? Yeah. Um, so the, the, the test I did here was uh, 20, 20 machines. On all 20 machines, I have 1.5 gig file. And, um, and I have also these files in HDFS. And I was just running a distributed grep on all the machines compared to distributed grep on uh, MapReduce through MapReduce on Hadoop. And of course, I mean, Hadoop does so much more, so that's why this um, benchmark is absolutely, well, unfair and doesn't really make that much sense. But my point is here, um, do you really know um, that maybe grep needle file is good enough for you? Um, getting into a Hadoop, uh, means um, a lot of overhead, and um, it only makes sense if you have actually have the data for it. Um, so, if you're thinking about Hadoop, actually, who is using Hadoop already? Okay. So, if you're thinking of going to Hadoop, uh, make a project projection of your data. Um, how much ingress do you have? Does it, is it really like gigabytes per day? Um, or is it just like, you know, a couple hundred megs? What is, how long uh, will you keep the data? What's the retention policy? Is it, um, do you have to keep the, the whole raw files forever? Is it, or can you compress it in a, in a, in a, in a way that's um, similar to, a f for example, round robin databases or something like that, where you can compress um, the data because you well, don't care so much about the history anymore as long as the counts are okay. You don't have to be able to um, dive into the particular days for three years ago or whatever. It really depends on the data. So look at your data um, and, and, and try to estimate your growth rate if you can. Um, because otherwise, maybe just San, a good rate system might be good enough for you. 
Um, or cloud storage, S3, or something like that. And um, my whole point is um, Hadoop comes with a great feature set, and there are really cool projects on top of it. But uh, if you're running ETLs uh, on a three node cluster, probably not the right thing. It's, uh, <laughs> I mean, you might want it in the future, but my startup experience tells me that um, use, not abuse your tools and be prepared to change quickly. After all, your first car probably was in the station wagon, um, so you can fit your kids in there in 10 years future, whatever. Um, I just know that um, Hadoop slows you down and um, that was the case, at least for us, um, at Juice, because we started really early on building for massive scale and stuff like that. And, well, um, we, in fact, we needed it later on, but it, uh, I think it cost us quite some velocity. But uh, there's a middle ground that you can take. So there's... Um, the question is, do you really have to run your cluster your own, uh, on your own? Um, is that, do you really uh, want to deal with the machines? And there are options out there to, um, to yeah, well, get a feeling for the system without buying 20 <laughs> machines and just, yeah, Hadoop. Um, as I said before, I'm not getting paid or whatever from Amazon, but you could have your data in S3, for example. And um, Amazon's Elastic Map is a great way to get started. Um, there's, there's a link with a pretty good tutorial on how to run PIG on, on, and use PIG on Amazon's Elastic Map Reduce. There's, um, you get a on-demand cluster. You, you don't have to be that. Um, have to have this cluster to be running all the time. Um, there's a drawback, though. I mean, you, with S3, I think it's still the, still the, the case that you don't have any data locality. So it's not quite um, as uh, as good as your own cluster, or whatever. But um, I don't know. I, I've used it um, as well, and it it, it was very useful. A um, couple of months ago, uh, probably even a year ago or whatever. Um, if you follow the SoundCloud engineering blog, we worked on a new stats system, and that was based on MongoDB, which didn't work out in the end. More details in, are in the blog if you're interested, or I can talk about it. But um, we had to migrate a lot of data from, um, from the actual MySQL database and we had to get it into, the, into this new system. Using uh, the normal route and replaying the data would have taken us weeks. And um, until we came up with this idea, and we didn't have Hadoop at that time, didn't have the Hadoop cluster on our own, so we uploaded the data to S3, which was pretty fast, and we prepared, we used the... Uh, Amazon Elastic Map Reduce cluster to prepare the data and we're able to reduce the, the, the time we needed to insert, um, import the data from two weeks to two days just through running some ETLs that we couldn't before. And so that's a pretty cool, uh, cool example of how to use um, for example, this elastic map reduce and to get started. And especially if you don't have, it, have recurring, ongoing jobs all the time, it's, uh, that's, that's nice. You can do something like that for, we do that currently with uh, Cassandra as well. You can basically create the SS tables through Hadoop and it's, it's a breeze to, to import data like that. And um, coming to the integration and uh, Blending Hadoop into your company has been, I think, one of the most challenging things with, when it comes down to Hadoop. The infrastructure stuff is probably not so, such a big 
deal. I mean, we are engineers, operations, we get stuff worked out and that's okay. Um, never big deal. Um, but the user accessibility has always been, um, always over the years. Um, providing proper interfaces to Hadoop and uh, provide it to be a real challenge in every company I've uh, worked with on, on this uh, topic. And because Hadoop is, yeah, most people perceive it as a black box. Once you have it in your company, um, Come, people come by and you're the data guy and, you know, I need the data. How can I get the data? And uh, they have a hard time adjusting. Their, I mean, of course, it, it's different. Like, if they're, if they're a programmer type of people and that, uh, yeah, cool, I heard about this MapReduce, let me try and stuff like that, that's fine. But if it gets in their way, it's a big problem. So don't underestimate the learning curve um, when you start with Hadoop and give the people tools to access the data in an easy um, to use fashion. So for, for the engineers, it's, uh, it, it's easier. Um, we had um, to use a custom input format. So here gets a little more technical. I hope that's okay. Um, and which is why the usual Hadoop tools don't, didn't really fit, that didn't work that well anymore. So what we came up with is just like, we started out with just Hadoop cat, replacing the Hadoop LS cat, so we can just like, well, cat a file, like you know from, from, from Unix, the cat command. So that was an easy way to get actually to the data, although we were using sequence files. And uh, now the engineers ended up using this with grep because it's easier than to, to basically just use the Hadoop cat and grep uh, on the command line because that's what they know. And the um, problem is it kind of means that you're sucking all the data from all the nodes, going through one machine, doing the grep, which is not really what you want to <laughs> do with with Hadoop. Um, so we came up with Hadoop Grab, which is just a shell around starting a quick map reduce job and posing a, bit, a little bit like uh, the Grab command. And it's amazing because this, um, if, if you look at our history, um, the, the job history, it accounts for a lot, a lot of jobs. So it, pretty, people pretty, were pretty happy to have this and it, uh, it's, it solved a lot of problems, um, just having this little script that does the MapReduce grep. Um, another another um, command line script that is useful or um, tool is that quite often you have your data in a hierarchical form in HFS, sorted probably by year, day, month, whatever and some are getting from this structure to the files that you want to include in your MapReduce jobs. Um, um, it's, sometimes it's also like a bit not so easy to do because you have to pick now this and all these various files for the job. And um, this Hadoop range basically just takes a couple of parameters and generates um, the appropriate um, files to include for the Hadoop job. Then there is streaming, uh, which is great for engineers. So we have people writing um, uh, streaming jobs and um, that, that works, works pretty well. You have to know though that with streaming, your partitioner and combiner um, have to be in Java and um, well, we we'll probably get into that a little bit later. And also mind that standard input performance is quite different between the languages. I mean, if you do a streaming job, it, doesn't, it probably doesn't really matter that much anyway because it's, it's a one-off or something like that. But uh, for example, Python C is much faster than Python. Python is much faster than Ruby when it comes to streaming. 
Um, for the non-engineering folks, it's a bit um, uh, harder. And um, the, I think a great way would be to mount your HDFS onto a shell server if you have that or somewhere. It would be really cool and I'm hoping to get that working. I haven't lo really looked into that yet, but um, to be able to mount the HDFS um, on my Mac. Uh, maybe th there, there's, I think there's in, in the new Hadoop, there's, um, um, there's a REST service kind of thing and you could, um, um, and there's a web dev stuff and you can look into that, for example. Um, then there's Pig and Hive. We heard about that before. Um, I think Pig is nice. Hive, uh, I have a bit of a problem there with like using SQL for this kind of work. It just feels wrong, and um, but I'm biased, just personal opinion. But it helps you to do one-off jobs and quickly get something out. Um, at Juice, we didn't have Peak or Hive. That was before their time. And, um, um, but what we did is, that's another option. I mean, is um, exporting data. And because a lot of BI tools and, and so on, they, they work with databases. Our analysts work with databases. They just had no clue. They, and they also didn't really want to get involved with this complicated MapReduce stuff, which is not, but that's how they felt. And so um, we had this, I think, daily dump of the last couple of weeks of, of data, and that was uh, inserted in the regular database, and that's what they could uh, work with. So yeah, that's it for the non-engineering folks. and. Um, Let's talk a bit about uh, MapReduce. Um, whenever I see the introductions to MapReduce, uh, some article or whatever, preferably citing the word count example for the hundredth time, uh, I cry a little bit inside. It's um <laughs> oh right, uh, okay. Yes, um, because. While everyone tries to convince you that about the abstract beauty of MapReduce, um, that is true, but you still need to know a little bit more about the details, at least if you want to write proper MapReduce jobs. At least that's my opinion, my experience, whatever. Because the omission of partitioners and reducer, uh, partitioners and um, combiners, for example, I couldn't. To be honest, I couldn't write proper MapReduce jobs without them, and I think they're essential for, uh, for, for the whole pipeline. And uh, I tried to come up with a slide showing the actual um, data flow through the framework, and um, so there's the mapper, and there's especially there's the combiner, and um, then there's the sorting, then there's the partitioner, which decides um, where the data goes into which, uh, onto which reducer, which helps you to for grouping operations a lot. Um, quite often, if you want to have like all the information of uh, of one user here and the other user is here, because the reducer actually combines most of the information then together to the real picture of that particular user, and uh, so. So partitioners are really, really important. Um, what I didn't know is until recently that they all even can run on uh, on the reducer side, since uh, I think that's like 018 or something like the like that. Combiners go back up a little bit. Um, are really useful to compress data. So um, you have. Um, Basically, before it hits I/O or something like that, you can reduce the data set that comes out of the map, um, and which helps a lot with I/O. So it reduces a lot the I/O and can make jobs really much faster. 
So uh, there is the output of a MapReduce job, and I do that because um, there isn't MapReduce, like, there's an issue open since 2009, and um, I think it would be useful to apply that. It's, the output is not really, it's, I think it's even random. It doesn't reflect the actually, um, the, the, the pipeline, like the data flows through, and it would be nice to have proper p uh, output. And I have a script that actually formats it like this. And what you can see here is um, this is basically a job how it should look like. Because um, you see, this is the input of the map out combiner, input of the reducer out. And you see, this is kind of like a curve, like this. And you have to basically watch this curve, and this, is, this would be the perfect shape. Um, you need to watch the, what you really want to watch, for, watch out for are the ratios between the inputs and the outputs. So, so we have a lot of inputs. On the map, we're already filtering out some stuff. The combiner crushes the whole data into just 409 and then Reducer reduces it even more. So this is a perfect job. In the real world, it's probably not like that, and much more data anyway, but it's an example. This is a job which is, um, which is still OK, because um, what you can see here is the input is 20,000 here. So the input is smaller. The mapper actually generates output. So this is when you, in the mapper, have output more than you actually input, which can make sense sometimes. Because, uh, for example, you want to, in one pipeline, you want to um, sort into in, in various um, uh, dimensions or something like that. This can be OK. It would result in a lot of I.O., but since we have a proper combiner, um, it, it basically crushes it back to 10,001, and that's why it's still OK. And um, I have to speed up a little bit here. So there's another thing that's, that you need to know is quite often the pipeline um, map reduce means um, sorting. It means we always talk about map reduce. That means like combining the two. There's the reducer and the mapper. Quite often, this combination doesn't really make sense. For example, if you do a grep or something, um, you only really care about the mapper. What you can do is set the reduce task to zero, and the, the whole sorting and the reducer part is left out, uh, which strips off quite a lot of, um, uh, which, yeah, strips a lot of I.O. And, and gives you a lot more performance. But keep in mind that right, that means the input files, the number of input files um, is the same as the output files, which means Doing this generates a lot of files. So you can easily have like 80,000 mappers. The result of the job, 80,000 files. So keep that in mind. Um, it puts stress on the name node, for example, and be careful. Um, we, we, are, we are using append currently, at least. and. Um, to my surprise, at least in uh, CDH3, we had to have this AOSafe record reader. Otherwise, we couldn't read from the current day. Um, this is uh, something special about a pen, I guess. And the, um, yeah, it was just throwing an exception. Uh, this is um, probably good to have if, you, if you're using a pen. A larger topic, uh, something that I talked about at the uh, Hadoop get-together here in Berlin before, um, um, is serialization. And um, there are a lot of good reasons for using binary representations. Space savings is certainly not. Um, what it gives you is like much more performance on the parsing side, probably. Really, but it really depends on your data. You have to check that. Um, 
Well, we're using we're using proto buffers now. We I've used ASN1 before, custom serial ASN and Thrift, and that was the old early days when there wasn't so much available. Now with Avro and stuff like that, it's been less of an issue. But um, um, yeah, my tool of choice currently proto buffers because it's just easier if you compare it to Thrift and stuff like that, and um, we're quite happy with it. But for the uh, when you're writing MapReduce jobs, you don't really have to use proto buffers, at least not um, when you're thinking about the data that throws to the pipeline. Um, usually, what you're dealing with are writables, and quite often people come up with uh, pairs and triples and stuff like that. Or there's the map writable where you <laughs> refer to the actual fields um, instead of a column way by name. These are all options to, to, to deal with data that flows in the, through the pipeline. Um, this custom writable I probably can uh, even provide is a way to make this easier and um, Having to care less, it's, it's just less boilerplate, and you still have um, the proper names on, on, on the um, data object that flows through the pipeline, and uh, it's very easy when it comes down to sorting. The fields are provided um, to the underlying um, codes, and um, def it defines an order, and you can easily like use this to push different data types through the pipeline at once, and um, this is pretty handy. There's fear the state. Uh, this is a bug when you write, work with writables. Uh, the interface of the... The, uh, the get bytes is... Be careful with that, because like, if you do it like this, like new write, write, where's, the, where's the bug? Well, the bug is that get bytes returns the buffer of the byte writable, but it doesn't cut off the buffer. It, it's a buffer that incre in, increases, so if you, the byte writables are being reused by the framework, so it fills up, and when you just use get bytes, for example, to create a string, you have garbage at the end. And this, uh, you have to know, and and if you don't, um, yeah, it takes a while to debug that and find that. There is, um, I really have to speed up. So there's uh, another very stupid API thing. Um, in the reducer, right now, you get passed in the values as an iterable. Unfortunately, you can iterate it only once. And there are situations where you want to iterate it twice. So uh, what you can do is you have to buffer um, the values. And um, we have a, basically have a buffer that is smart about keeping it in memory and writing it to disk and stuff like that. This is, has been applied to O210. Um, there's an issue where you can basically reset the iterator which can come in handy. Um, bit sets, I urge you to look at the Lucene utils. Um, this can be handy to keep uh, sample sets um, in memory. For example, if, you, if you're working on, like, say you have a customer that has 50 million users, and you, have, you don't want to keep all these 15 million IDs in uh, memory, so, um, because it can take up quite a bit of space. So, with this, is, this is kind of an optimized bit set, and that's, that's kind of cool to use. There are, um, again, data structures that, um, probably that, I think there were a couple of blog posts earlier and stuff like that. Um, that can be very useful f when you're writing your mapper and reducer. And um, because even, for the mapper and the reducer, you should be aware that you don't get memory bound and get out of memory um, exceptions and stuff like that. So there are ways to keep this down. Um, these data structures are useful um, 
to help with that, and um, I just urge you to have a look. So as a few general tips, um, test on the small data sets first. I think that's obvious. Um, test on your local machine, at least if you get the stupid uh, compression working. Um, that's, uh, that's something I wanted to uh, talk about a little bit later on. I probably don't have the time anymore. But, um, uh, okay. And um, use many reducers. I've, I've seen quite a few people that say, uh, yeah, no, I want to generate this one file, and um, you know, that's why they set the reducers to one. That's not why. I mean, that's not why you want to use Hadoop. I mean, if you set reducer to one on a 20, 30 node cluster, that's, I'm sorry, stupid. So um, always combine, consider a combiner and petitioner and uh, pick streaming for one-time jobs. And um, we use Java, but preferably Scala for recurring jobs now. <coughs> There's a pretty good book that is on GitHub, actually, and it's freely available. And it describes like joins and stuff like a bit more complicated algorithms to, uh, to, for, for using MapReduce in a pretty good way. And um, I can recommend that. Uh, just a few minutes left. Jeez. OK. Um, operations. Um, we're using, I never understood the whole secure shell script thingy. We're using our runit and init D, and we set up the machines through Chef or Puppet, and uh, we use uh, distributed shell to actually talk to the machines. Um, this is the hardware configuration. We, we currently are using um, no RAID on the data nodes, um, mirroring on the, on the name nodes. And um, monitoring, make sure um, you monitor all, your whole cluster. Well, of course. Uh, make sure you use the ganglia contact, if you use ganglia, and that's what this is about. Um, we're using ganglia. Use the gang ganglia context 3.1. Um, usual I/O stats monitoring applies, of course. Um, when you monitor, you can see stuff like that, and you um, and it's kind of interesting to see what happened here. So that is total cap capacity. Here you can see we got new machines, and uh, it's not just buying a date. It's just not like buying a, a, a tape. You always have to wait for new machines even if it's getting really close to being full. Here we turn on um, compression, um, and another compression, and another compression until we are all compressed out. And, uh, and you can see that the uh, growth rate is sl slightly less than, than here. I think this is here where um, disk failed, so. Uh, for compression, we used uh, we dis we compared a few numbers with our data, and um, in the end, decided to use Snappy, uh, which is which came from uh, I think came up from 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 Google. Uh, works really well. Um, less uh, CPU um, than BZIP and GZIP. You cannot split and uh, SEO. Uh, we had problems with in on at least on. Um, um, elastic map reduce. The only problem is Snappy. If anyone gets Snappy to work with Hadoop on OS X, um, talk to me. Um, there's another little tiny project we have uh, um, that Hadoop expired. You basically a janitor to clean up the, your um, your um, your HDFS. Uh, don't forget that as well. Uh, we have a lot of uh, jobs running and writing into TMP, and um, yeah, you really um, need to get stuff removed as well. And we also had this janitor doing stuff like uh, joining. So, for example, when you have multiple files per day or something like that, we wanted to reduce the number of files um, because also we, because we thought that. Um, um, 
small files occupy a whole block, and um, so we thought it would be saving us a lot of this space to combine the files as well. But um, once the small file problem is properly understood and you search on the mailing lists, you know that, um, well, a 4K file only uh, is 4K on, the, uh, on, on disk. And I'm really running out of time, and uh, <laughs> I'm sorry for that. I didn't think that's taking so long. So, um, uh, I think most of these things um, are obvious when I hand out the slides. There's uh, one major thing that bugs me, and uh, that was like with O14, and it's now still the same thing. Your ETC hosts um, operations. Usually, when we get machines from operations, the ETC host looks like that. So the external name is on a local um, local IP. Um, we have to remove that for Hadoop to probably work. Another story I had to tell. I have to tell is uh, record awareness is important, uh, especially when you don't talk to your operations guys, probably. Um, so we got um, our Hadoop cluster at SoundCloud, and uh, we're running some crazy jobs, and suddenly operators say, wait a sec, something is wrong with the site. We, what? And it turns out the mapper use machines were in the same we are in the same rec as front-end machines and stuff like that. So we didn't brief them properly, and that's something you should do, um, how to set up the cluster also from an um, operations perspective. Have, have, have the cluster very, in very separate recs, and um, so the only workaround we could do at that time is because they, they were in a data center, we could just like yeah, make them a rec aware, and that fixed a lot of things for us. And, um, well, after that, some shoveling around of machines, I guess. When you do that, when you put that um, script into place, you have to run something like that to, to, you, to change the replication factor. So basically, um, Hadoop puts the um, blocks in, into the proper um, positions, so the policy, the rec policy is uh, is uh, is not violated. Uh, I'll leave that out, and I'm basically <coughs> over time. But uh, just quickly on the community, I think the talk before already um, covered this a bit. So Hadoop is still still a very popular um, um, topic. And this is just taken from the mailing archives. So not as sophisticated um, analysts through Hadoop. But um, what I've seen is um, with Hadoop, there's an enterprise effect. And unfortunately, what, I, what we can call the community effect, which happened in 2011, um, the enterprise effect is that more and more companies buy into this, and stab stab stability has become much more important, and um, which slows down development quite a bit. I've seen it in other projects before, and uh, it's a little unfortunate, but that's how it is. What really is unfortunate, which would be great not to have, is the community effect. There was a blog post from some companies that basically currently mm, uh, trying to be the Hadoop guys and uh, fighting over it, and it doesn't help the community at all. So um, I guess uh, maybe that's, I don't know, f maybe for them. So um, it led to something like this. These are the versions and uh, of the various branches and something like that, which leads to this for me sometimes. And um, but in general, the, the whole development has picked up, and um, I think we're on a, on a good way out of this. And um, I don't really have much time for, for the future, but um, uh, here to talk about it's, 
I think incremental real time um, are some very hot topics with uh, with MapReduce, and um, there are a couple of talks throughout the conference that um, actually cover this, and it's going to be really interesting to see. Um, there are other um, projects there, I just name them here, um, like Stratosphere, Pangol, Spark, and stuff like that. They come with new APIs, which is really, uh, which I think is also worth uh, looking at. Um, there's there's the new Hadoop with Yarn, and there's uh, Peregrine, and there's also Mapper, which I probably, which I think is probably a better implementation than. Um, well, I wish they would have um, contributed their changes anyway. Sorry, Ted. <clears throat> so um, there's real-time tools, Storm, Asper, and and um, there's incremental processing approaches like Twister, Haloop. And you can even have CouchDB um, for um, incremental MapReduce, big topic. I just leave you with a current couple of sessions I'm definitely going to attend. Um, I think they sound very interesting. And um, the takeaways, use Hadoop only if you must. It's great if you have the data. Um, understand the pipeline so you get the best out of it and unbox your black box so your data gets, that your data user actually get the best out of it. Sorry for being so quick uh, at the end. Um, so anyone have any idea what the uh, artist movie, uh, the, the, the artist and the song was that? Yeah, over there. Queens of the Stone Age song? Very good. OK. So that's yours or a beer a lot later on. So OK, thank you.